Welcome back. Yesterday I spoke about Moore's Law and the exponential change that's brought to the world through computing. Today I want to talk about my passion, which is mobility and transportation, and in particular, self-driving cars. They're going to change the world in ways that you be, may be very surprised to see. Now this is because this is Moore's Law, which we spoke of yesterday, coming to transportation. The computer becomes the most important part of the car. The computer and the car get married and the result is something quite remarkable. Now the first reason people got into this was actually a very positive goal, that of saving lives. And that's possible because human beings are simply not very good drivers. Every year around the world we kill over 1.3 million people in car accidents. It's an absolutely staggering and astonishing number. But it's not the only amazing number that you'll learn about cars. Now 40 percent of those fatalities involve alcohol and so there's a, a plus and that robots very rarely drink and you can get past that. But another amazing number is that more than 60 percent of the land in some of our cities is devoted to the car. It's parking lots and driveways and roads and these sorts of things. So we've given our cities to cars in ways that we've become blind to. The automotive industry or at least the ground transportation industry around the world is worth about five trillion dollars. That's the third largest industry in the world, another amazing number. We spend every year about 50 billion hours, 50 billion hours turning steering wheels. We won't have to do that in the future. To put that in context, Americans total labor output is about 240 billion hours. Now all of that driving emits about 8 billion tons of carbon dioxide. In fact, 25% of the energy, 25% of the greenhouse gases comes from cars. And my favorite number I worked out was that the whole human race every year drives about 1.7 light years. Now, send me a note if you use light years in your work as a unit of human activity. So with all those huge numbers, everybody's involved. Every company, every car company, tons of startups. Now the big uh, car companies are all behind uh, a sort of startup, or rather a project funded by Google, now called Waymo, which is the leader. They're in fact the only company actually running a service where cars with nobody in them are running around near Phoenix, picking up passengers and taking them around. It's just a pilot right now, but it's real. Another company that's involved is Tesla. Now a lot of people think that Tesla, because of its radical approach, very different from everyone else, could be the leader. Everyone else thinks that they're probably in last place because they're ignoring some very important principles. Um, the big car companies all put major projects together, although we're going to talk about the fact that some of them are scaling back. Now one of the big car companies that is going to have a problem is this one, which may have difficulty saying to people, trust your life to our software. I mean, wh why would we lie to you? Well. That scandal actually may have very positive results for that company because it's forced them to rethink their business and forced them to rethink what it is to be a car company and maybe something good will come out of that. Now there are lots of startups involved, tons and tons of startups, many with valuations over a billion dollars, the unicorn number, some even with funding more than a billion dollars. That's because the prize is so big and everybody wants their piece of it. Apple is another company that's in this, by the way. Now, Apple's a very secretive company, so they haven't talked very much about what their vehicle does. I've learned one top secret thing about the Apple car, and that is it'll only work if you get the new iPhone. So make sure to get that. Another company playing the game is Uber. Now, there's several interesting things about Uber here, but the one I'm going to talk about first is that many believe the entire automotive industry becomes about selling rides instead of selling cars. Today it's all about selling cars, but Uber is the number one brand in the world at selling rides and that's a good position to be in. Now unfortunately Uber is the company that also has had the only fatal accident in testing this technology. That accident was the fault of their safety driver, human error, but nonetheless it set things back quite a bit. And in the breakout we can talk about safety and accident issues if you're interested in doing that. We can leave the ground though. Here is Sebastian Thrun. Sebastian was my mentor into this space, got me into it, got many people into it, won the DARPA Grand Challenge, started Google's famous self-driving car team. And today, Sebastian is actually working on a vehicle like this. This is a flying vehicle which combines a multi-rotor approach with fixed wings, and it's able to take people from place to place without needing an airport. 
one of the sister companies to that company actually has a vehicle we see in a video here, which is actually, let's watch it take off. Um, this vehicle is able to take off in a flat position like a drone and then very quickly switch to flying on its wings, which is the efficient way to fly. If you're going to save energy, you can't fly like a drone for very long. Now, scooters are another incredibly efficient way to travel. They're 10 times more efficient than most transit systems, but they're causing a problem. Now, this is a picture I took in Germany. Only the Germans return their scooters so nicely lined up. And cities are complaining about the fact that scooters are being left on sidewalks, uh, cluttering things up and, and uh, getting in the way of people. So there are several companies, I'm involved in one, that are trying to work out a way to actually automate scooters to make them drive um, on themselves, not while you're on them, but just so they can get to you to deliver themselves, to um, uh, take themselves to be recharged. This is a prototype you see here. But eventually, if scooters can do this, they won't clog the streets and they'll get people from place to place in the cities. And the result will be much in the way of energy savings and congestion savings on urban streets. If you want to get really radical, there are people trying to bring together Elon Musk's vision of Hyperloop, which is a uh, train of sorts which travels in an evacuated tube with near vacuum. If you're in that low pressure area, you can travel extremely efficiently and at very high speeds, getting in 30 minutes between San Francisco and Los Angeles, for example, or even getting in just two or three minutes between different regions of a big town. That could also dramatically change how and where we live and how we get around. Uh, we're also looking at moving cargo. Delivery Robots, this is another company I've been involved with. There are several companies trying to make robots that will deliver goods at very low costs without needing to send UPS trucks out. These ones go on the sidewalks, other ones go on the road, and they'll be able to bring you anything in 30 minutes, not just a pizza the way we deliver today. So there are a number of big questions that need to be answered before this happens, and we're going to discuss some of those in the breakout rooms. Right now, I'll touch on a couple of them for you. Particularly interesting is the question of why the big car OEMs, like Mercedes, as I said, are pulling back and scaling down their self-driving efforts, trying to build something more like the Tesla Autopilot. Well, uh, it is a hard problem, and it's harder than they thought it was. That's certainly true, and we're going through the trough of the famous hype cycle. At the same time, it's pretty clear the car companies did not want to see their industry turned upside down by startups at the speed that startups move. They would rather do it and own it later, but at the speed that they want to move at. There are also some technological problems that people are working very hard to solve and, and are still not fully done. The hardest one of all, by the way, is not just doing it, but proving you've done it. Proving to yourself and your lawyers that you've done it. That's actually very difficult, and you can't really ship until you can feel that confidence. So another problem is predicting what others are doing on the road. We're getting pretty good at driving, but the road's pretty chaotic, and human beings are good at modeling what other human beings will do, and that's something that computers still have some learning to do. Another interesting question is how to make sensing happen very quickly. We've got some pretty good sensors, but we're not fast enough at noticing changes on the road in order to react as quickly as we would like to. The big question everyone asks, I always get asked is when? When will I be able to ride in it? The answer, I'll tell you now, is June 23rd, uh, 2022 at 4.22 p.m. Pacific time. Well, not really. There isn't a specific time. It's a safety goal. People will deploy this when they feel it is time that they can deploy it safely and they will not face a big liability for doing so. And nobody can really name that date, but we can have some ideas about exactly how this will play out and make some guesses on that date. Well, look at the big changes. Transportation is the reason for a city. Mobility is the circulatory system of a city. It can't survive without it. And the type of transportation changes the city. The car changed the city. The trolley changed the city. And self-driving vehicles will make as big a change to our cities and how we live. They're also going to save, as I mentioned, billions of tons of CO2. They're going to make companies trillions of dollars. That's why everyone is in this game. Some of the biggest money stakes out there. And as I started saying, they have the potential to save millions of lives. So I hope to talk about many of these other issues in the breakout session and look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much.